Welcome to the Upstate Energy Series. I'm Luke Perry. Today, my guest is Suzanne Lynch, Professor of Practice in Economic Crime at Utica College. Professor Lynch has extensive experience in risk analysis and fraud control in the financial service industry. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you for having me, Professor Perry. <laughs> Our topic today is cryptocurrency. This is something that a lot of people have heard about, but most people know very little. So it's great to have an expert to help us make sense of this. For starters, could you please define and explain a little bit what cryptocurrency is? Uh, well, thank you, Luke. And believe me, um, this is a field or uh, you know, the topic of currency is only about five to seven years old. So I don't know if we, we're all experts yet in this, uh, because it is evolving. But cryptocurrency, and it's probably the most simplistic, um, if it can be called that, is um, a kind of mathematical calculation. And we're not going to get into the technical specs of this because um, your eyes will glaze. Uh, but think of it as a computer generated currency. And when I say currency, there's no government issuing it. It is uh, not, as we, the term for your historical uh, folks, you know, it's not fiat currency. It's not issued by any government in the world. It's a generated peer or person to person value that's calculated by massive computers. And so using this technology, this huge mathematical calculation, if you ever see it, because when we talk about cryptocurrency or the, the more popular Bitcoin, there are no little coins, right? We always see those pictures. There is, there's no substance. It is all in a, it's a computer generated calculation and value. So um, we can't go out and get Bitcoins or Litecoins and all that. And so what it ultimately is, cryptocurrency is a person-to-person -person transfer with no government issuing it, right? It's a trust system where you're transferring value from, let's say, if I want to buy, and we'll talk about this you know, later, if I want to buy a new Tesla, right, car, um, I can now pay for it with, a bit, with Bitcoins. Um, and so as we've seen, it's become more and more popular. And I know we'll talk about that. Uh, but this ability um, to just do person to person transfers um, has become more and more um, expansive in business, um, in industry, um, as well as, um, which we'll talk about as well, um, you know, one more way for bad guys to move money. Thank you, that's very helpful. Can you provide a little context in terms of where this came from and how it's begun to, to go mainstream? Well, it's interesting because Bitcoin, and we'll just use that because that's the one everyone really hears about. There's a number of different uh, crypto currencies out there, again, on the same concept. But there was a mathematical formula which we still, you know, there's rumors of uh, a gentleman in Japan who actually created the crypto. Um, and, you know, it's never been confirmed. Nobody's ever individually identified themselves. So really this is the brainchild years ago of, of one, maybe two people. Cause again, we still don't know. So what's happened is it typically it was more underground many, you know, back and forth, because you can move these types of values, crypto, you can move them internationally, right? So just as we think about, you know, if you're traveling and you want to, you're going to Europe and you need euros, right? So you have to convert US dollars to euros. Uh, you don't have to do that in any of the cryptocurrency because you're bypassing any government um, you know, bank, central bank of a different country, things like that. So historically, it was always kind of more underground. Now we see it becoming more and more mainstream. As I stated, businesses, you know, are buying a Tesla, um, PayPal, the regulators, um, government regulators are approving. Uh, 
um, some types of interactions with Bitcoin, and especially in this country and US dollars. So for instance, PayPal has partnered with um, you know, Bitcoin. So you can actually use your PayPal account to buy cryptocurrency. So we can see that there's other um, organizations. My former um, employer many years ago, MasterCard um, is going to be accepting or having the ability for folks to buy cryptocurrency. So it's also, it's become kind of like um, an investment, which, you know, it is a very volatile investment because um, we, you know, see in the papers one day, one Bitcoin could be worth, you know, thousands of dollars and the next day it plummets. So it truly is a, it's a risk calculation. However, more and more businesses are willing to, and frankly, maybe legitimize it even more. Well, let's pick up on that theme of the legitimate purposes, perhaps for business of, of Bitcoin, as well as the illegitimate purposes. And, and you mentioned government quite a bit and what you've been saying. It seems to me this poses a pretty serious challenge in some ways to, to government, but at the same time, you suggest they're also sanctioning it in some ways. Can you help us understand that? Sure. So on both um, the federal level um, and actually the state, the New York Department of um, Finance uh, approves. There are So there are companies uh, that um, go for regulatory approval to allow the buying and selling of cryptocurrencies. So that's you know, really kind of protecting a consumer. This is a legitimate, you know, uh, one of the more legitimate uh, and well-known is Coinbase where you can actually go on their website and purchase um, different types of crypto. Could be Bitcoin, Litecoin, Monero, all sorts of different types. And so they went, now you can buy PayPal. So in New York state, they look at, you know, all the different, the banking, because the banks are sometimes getting in the middle of it, right? Because you need your cash to buy the Bitcoin. Um, th this is where, we wish we had a whiteboard, right? Just like in the class to kind of give you how the flow would go. On the federal level, um, there are concerns um, as well because there are a lot of um, regulatory um, rules that banks and financial services must follow. For instance, how the federal government considers Bitcoin and all that is more of a term we call a money service business, right? It's not a bank, but it's a money service business. So what would be an example to kind of relate for uh, crypto? A money service business would be Western Union, right? You can go wire money um, outside the US or within the US, MoneyGram, things like that. So non-banks that are able to transmit value. So with that, um, the, there is a unit within the United States Treasury called the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. And banks have to report um, what we call suspicious activity, um, file reports with the government. And so banks are becoming more and more concerned about, they can see that because you can legitimately buy cryptocurrency, right? What's an unusual amount? Did this customer, you know, buy uh, crypto from a legitimate person? Because very few people actually create their own cryptocurrency on a computer because it takes such huge computing power. The, the vast majority of folks would never have a huge mainframe, a uh, big, you know, computer, they still have those, um, that would, that's needed to generate it. So, so the federal government is looking at this um, um, somewhat suspiciously. Um, banks are trying to struggle as to how do we monitor this because there are you know, valid absolute reasons. Um, in fact, uh, looking at the legitimacy of it, um, Morgan Stanley, a huge financial services um, company is now allowing their people um, their clients to buy cryptocurrency. 
Um, so some banks are with it. You know, at one point, J.P. Morgan Chase said, mm, we don't think that's the future. Even Warren Buffett thought, you know, thinks that. But you can see how these are changing. At the same time, it's trying to identify the risk that can be associated with it. And the vast majority of transactions are valid. People, you know, it's a new investment vehicle, right? Um, so, but uh, trying to monitor it, because remember, there's no central bank that issues this type of currency. So we're kind of in a, you know, the wild, wild west right now. Which is, is a dangerous place in some ways. I, I see the incentives for businesses to get on board with this to, to make money. Uh, are there similar incentives for the government to do so? Or is it more just a regulatory protect consumers type approach? It, that's really it, the regulatory and consumers uh, protecting and protecting, you know, the uh, some of the financial services that may, uh, you know, who are they doing business with? And that that's across all government, whether it's the state, federal, how, you know, there is an adage in what we, you know, what is used in my world, it's called know your customer. All right, huge um, application from banking, credit unions, Western Union, uh, PayPal, all these variety all have to follow this, um, frankly, regulatory um, statute that comes from the Federal Reserve, the US Treasury, New York State Finance. How do you vet the customers? How do you, in essence, follow the money, right? So obviously with crypto, that's become far more challenging. Um, you know, there's, uh, how do we follow the money? Uh, because it's not money and it's not like you have a regular person's name and address. All you have is a mathematical encrypted calculation that has value, right? When we all agree in, in the very basic historical, right? We exchange, you know, at one point what we exchange um, animal hides, right? For food, you know, different things like that back before, you know, in the beginning of civilization. So this is, we, not that I want you to think of, you know, Bitcoin as animal hide, but the concept is there, right? Um, we all agree that there's a value. And so businesses are, of course, you know, we, we like this. And the international aspect from a person, a peer-to-peer, person-to-person network, it's a lot cheaper to send someone money, quote, value, overseas from the United States, because you don't, you know, when you have to go to a traditional bank, it costs you money to try and transfer funds to somebody, let's say in Europe or in Asia, whatever. This is seen as a low cost, cut out the middleman. However, the more legitimate transfers, let's say from a bank to a Bitcoin and want to transfer, we always like, you know, financial services, we can charge a fee for that because we can move some money. So there is that, you know, we could get some fees out of this as well. And at the same time, the customer is aware and knows that we will keep their money safe. I know that was kind of a convoluted answer. However, it just, it shows us um, the many ways that um, financial services are kind of struggling uh, with, you know, what's the best, most efficient and risk free way to move the funds and be involved with cryptocurrency. You provided a fascinating explanation of the nuances and considerations involved here from a variety of perspectives, business, government. How about everyday people? I, I know you're not in the business of providing financial advice or anything like that, but is there anything you can offer to, to, to make sense of this in a, in a basic way for everyday people who are kind of unsure what to make of this and whether or not to use it in any capacity? Oh, let's see. Um, you know, I think, um, frankly, it's fascinating. And um, I know I'm obviously going to be on record for saying this, but, you know, the beauty of, let's say, Bitcoin, I've been thinking about maybe, you know, doing a little bit of investing just to see. Um, so for instance, because in Bitcoin, 
you don't have to buy like one Bitcoin, obviously, as you know, on our salaries, I don't really think I could buy one Bitcoin, <laughs> could not afford it, um, um, nor will I use my retirement. But, you know, buy, you can buy pieces of Bitcoin, kind of like think of it, you know, a dollar bill and then you get the change, you know, you can buy in, and I kind of, so I can, you know, my experience and, and what I've done for God knows over 20 years, you know, you have to kind of see how it works logically as we, you know, even if I'm teaching my students about, um, you know, cryptocurrency and whatever, see how it works. And so, um, again, I'm familiar with, you know, um, Coinbase because uh, they were one of the first. They have a very um, uh, strong um, what we, re regulatory and compliance program. They went out and hired a bunch of former U.S. attorneys, um, you know, to make sure that they stayed above board um, and that kind of thing. So I thought, you know, maybe maybe I'll, I'll try I'll try that. What we're starting to see on the opposite, the legitimate way, it's like, oh, this would be, you know, an investment. Or now we see you can buy, you might be able to buy cryptocurrency um, via ATMs. Um, so we're pushing it down to more and more to the consumer level where businesses are still in this, you know, let's try it a bit and see what happens. But from a consumer perspective, we're seeing more of a spread. Now, again, you can't, you know, some countries, frankly, some countries have, because they're more centralized in their banking systems, we're here in the U.S., you know, uh, we have some regulators, but everybody else, it's kind of still the wild, wild west as far as having the Federal Reserve, which is our central bank, does not um, really monitor or control the banks. They regulate them and say, you have to do this, but they don't do the control day to day. Outside the US, central banks have far more control. And, and so there are countries that are very concerned about their citizens you know, getting involved or their financial systems, right? So um, you know, for now, I think I'm gonna, I may give it a whirl just a little bit. Um, um, but there's, and there's other cryptocurrencies that, um, you know, you can buy one currency and uh, then transfer it to another currency. So, um, you know, I like to see how I can follow the money on that. Thank you. And it seems like caution makes sense, uh, given the amount of unknowns. And my last question relates to that, given that you've been watching this closely and we're trying to make sense of where the situation is at now, what do you see around the bend? What do you think comes next out of this? Or what are you focused on? And what are you looking for as this continues to unfold? So just like, you know, this is a brand new, well, it is brand new when we think of, you know, monetary policies and, and fiat government currency. So with this comes um, more and more challenges, um, in, you know, th there's the good legitimate, which is the majority of crypto, uh, but now we're, we're seeing more and more types of scenarios where, um, of course, the bad guys, um, which is a huge umbrella of different types, are, are using cryptocurrency as well, um, because it's harder to follow the funds. So when we look at where we see some real problems, um, and you know, the government is actually Department of Justice. There have been some prosecutions um, of what we call money laundering, right? So what we're seeing is because uh, whether it's just traditional, um, you know, scams where you know I'm going to meet a Nigerian prince, but he needs money um, to come to this country. Could you send me Bitcoin? So it's still the same types of fraud that occur, but people want Bitcoin. You go on the dark web um, and people want it. You could always buy, let's say, stolen credit card numbers, um, which I always thought was interesting because before they would say, yeah, you can pay for it with a credit card to get it. Well, of course we can track you then, right? So now you see whether it's guns, credit card numbers, um, all sorts of things on the dark web, they want to buy, you can only buy it with cryptocurrency. 
because it's harder to follow. So the other issue, because as I stated, it, it, there's no government bank, right? So it, since it operates outside the banks internationally, we've seen, um, frankly, ISIS, um, uh, many of the terrorist groups have, um, they actually, there's websites that solicit donations and say they accept Bitcoin or Litecoin or Monero. Um, so we're seeing that, uh, again, legitimate being used now because of the challenges of being able to follow, understand the, because it's all encrypted, there's passwords and codes, um, things like that in order to unleash the value. Um, and so that's, that's very concerning um, from all different countries. Um, there's been a group of countries we call the Financial Action Task Force that has put out special reporting. The uh, Department of Treasury as well, like I said, that group Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, they, they do have a real concern. And, and a lot of it as well is, um, you know, investigators understanding how they, how they utilize the money. Professor Suzanne Lynch, thanks so much for helping us make sense of this complicated topic. And thank you for watching. For more, go to ucpublicaffairs.com.